CNN's aviation safety expert just said something that could get you killed, and we need to talk about it. Hey guys, my name is Katie. I'm a professional pilot, and I am here today to talk to you about the crash of the ATR-72 in Brazil on August 9th, 2024, and something that I saw an aviation safety expert say in regards to that crash, which really showed me that there is still a very dangerous myth in aviation regarding flying and icing conditions that we need to discuss. So here's the background. On August 9th, 2024, an ATR-72, which is a twin-engine turboprop, crashed in Brazil when the plane entered a flat spin at 17,000 feet. Tragically, all 62 people on board were killed. With the investigation underway, we do not know exactly what caused this crash, but recent data from the cockpit voice recorders has turned investigators towards ice accumulation on the airframe possibly leading to a degraded aerodynamic performance and ultimately leading to the aircraft entering that spin. From the cockpit voice recorded data, it appears that the pilots took off, they used the anti-ice equipment and the de-ice equipment for a short period of time and then flew for over an hour with electronic ice detection alerts going off and not using the pneumatic boots. Now, it does appear that there could have been a failure of that item, but we do not know exactly why they didn't use them. We are not sure and we're not going to speculate. But after about an hour, they began to get ready to go on their approach. They began to get low speed alerts. And then after being asked by air traffic control to make a turn towards a specific point, it appears that they really began to lose control of the aircraft and entered what looks like a flat spin. Now, again, it is a really tragic event and we don't know what happened. But I do want to discuss some of the data that is around this crash so that we can learn from this and begin to get rid of a myth that really is dangerously hanging around in aviation. So in order to get into this, I'd like to talk a little bit about how anti-ice and de-ice works on this kind of plane and other turboprops. Generally, on these kinds of airplanes, you turn the prop heat on, which is an anti-ice system when you enter icing conditions. Icing conditions in general is defined as less than 10 degrees Celsius and visible moisture, which is defined as cloud fog with visibility less than one statute mile, rain, snow, sleet, ice crystals, anything like that. Now, this could be dependent on a company SOP or the different federal laws that you're flying under, but that's just a general good guideline. So if you're in flight, you go into a cloud and it's below freezing or even below 10 degrees Celsius, you are in icing condition. Now, this doesn't mean that your airplane is 100% of the time going to get ice. This is just the meteorological situation that has to be existing to even begin to suspect you could get ice. In-flight icing is really tricky because there's really no way to know exactly where you're going to get ice. You could have a person fly through a radar return in the winter that looks like there could be a lot of moisture and get absolutely no ice, even though they're in freezing temperatures. And pyreps are really helpful for basically knowing where people are actually experiencing ice. So this is why it can be very hazardous and challenging because you can't just say, well, if there's a cloud and it's negative 5, 10, whatever, you're going to get ice. You really don't know until you get into that weather condition whether or not you will be getting airframe icing. So when entering icing conditions in these kinds of airplanes, generally you're going to turn on prop heat and usually something else such as an inertial separator or heating of a stall horn, which will then tell the airplane that you're flying in icing conditions. The reason the plane needs to know this is so that they can talk to and adjust the stall warning system. When your airframe is covered in ice, specifically the lift producing surfaces of your airframe, you are going to stall at an unknown angle of attack because it depends on the type of ice and the way that it's affecting the smooth airflow over the wings and the tail. Obviously, ice is going to increase the weight of the aircraft, increase the drag, and it's going to disrupt smooth airflow over those lift producing surfaces. So when you're covered in ice, that's the only time that your wing is going to stall at a lower angle of attack than critical. And we don't know where that is. So generally, these airplanes will just have their stall warning system calibrate off of a much lower angle of attack. In the Pilatus, for example, the angle of attack will go eight degrees down from where it normally is indicating critical, and then it'll start to give you stall warning indications at that point when you're in icing conditions. Now that we have a little bit better understanding of how in-flight icing works and how these planes in particular operate in icing conditions, let's talk specifically about this accident. In this particular accident, it does seem that the pilots had electronic ice detector alerts going on throughout the flight for over an hour without activating the boots. So the boots are a pneumatic system on the leading edge of the wing and the tail, which will basically inflate and crack ice off of those surfaces. We're trying to basically just keep ice off of the airframe so that we can keep the aerodynamics uninterrupted and keep weight off of the airplane. If you're not familiar with this airplane, the pilots cannot see the wings. The cockpit is out in front of it 
and they cannot look out to the right and just see how much ice is picking up on the wing like some other plane. So this is how, in general, a pilot could get into a very dangerous situation with stalling because they were seeing a very high airspeed still, but getting low speed alerts. They were at 191 knots when they got their first low speed alert. For whatever reason, they continued to slow their airspeed without using the boots as much as I would think they should in order to try to get ice off the airframe. They just let the airspeed continue to slow down. And of course, part of this was because they did level off at 17,000 feet, and then they began to enter a turn, which aerodynamically will increase the load on the aircraft and make you stall at a higher airspeed anyways. Now, like I said, the investigation is still underway, and I think it's very important to not draw conclusions from this minimal information we have from the cockpit voice recorder. All I'm saying is in this flight so far, we know that the pilots were getting ice. They were not using the de-ice boots throughout the entire flight when they were being told that there was ice on the airframe. They did get low speed alerts and then it appears that they entered a spin. So with all of that being said, I want to now talk about a very shocking quote that I read from CNN. Now, before I get into this quote or my personal opinion on it, I just want to say the purpose of this video is not to attack anyone. This is simply to increase aviation safety because of a myth that I have heard repeated and even taught by Czech airmen and other people in very high level, very skilled, very experienced positions, which is unsafe according to the FAA and the NTSB. Because I do not think it's appropriate to make this a personal attack, I'm not going to be naming the aviation safety expert, but I will be quoting what they said to CNN. After looking at the report, aviation safety analyst told CNN on Saturday that it appeared the crew may have, quote, armed the de-ice boots on the plane too soon, just a few seconds after the de-ice warning, adding that it must be allowed to build on the leading edge of a plane's wing so it will break off. If you don't let it build first, as in this case, the ice simply builds up in the inflated boot. Then the inflation cycle is under the ice dome and does nothing, he said, adding that it then gets heavier and heavier. So basically what this aviation safety expert is saying in speculating to, to CNN is that ice bridging could have been a factor in this crash. And this is what I want to talk about. The myth of ice bridging, which is still dangerously repeated throughout aviation. So ice bridging is the idea that the pneumatic de-ice boots, which inflate on the leading edge of the wing and the leading edge of the horizontal stabilizer, have a possibility of just pushing the ice out away from the boot and then the boot cannot reach that ice bridge anymore to crack it off. So you'd basically have like an ice shell over the leading edge of the wing that the de-ice boot now just cannot reach instead of that de-ice boot cracking that ice off and it falling off and being removed from the airframe. I would like to share what the FAA and the NTSB has said about ice bridging. And then I would like to share my personal experience with it and why I think it's important to discuss. So the conversation around ice bridging really changed in 2005 when there was a crash of a Cessna Citation 560 in Pueblo, Colorado. After this crash, there was a large congregation of airplane manufacturers and FAA safety individuals. And basically they said that there is no data that ice bridging exists. There is not one single plane crash that the FAA or the NTSB has said was caused by ice bridging. The only crashes that we have definitively linked to icing conditions have been because the plane was flying in icing conditions that were outside of its ability to handle or because the pilots failed to operate the de-icing system, meaning these planes have crashed because pilots are not using the de-ice boots, not because there's ice bridging going on. Now, this is a great article to read. It is on the FAA website and I will include the link, but I want to quote a certain part that I think is really important. Quote, the NTSB doesn't believe that ice bridging occurs in aircraft equipped with modern de-ice boots. The board suggests that pilots should turn on the boots as soon as the airplane enters icing conditions and begins accumulating ice. While some residual ice may cling to the boots between inflation cycles, the NTSB conceded that this disappears during subsequent cycles. The board also said that it has never investigated any accidents that involved ice bridging. Later in this article, Bond talks about how NASA has not seen any ice bridging in their tests that they have done. He also said that after talking to all of the manufacturers, 
of these boots, they have also never seen ice bridging in their flight testing as well. Next, I'd like to look at another FAA safety article, which talks about the pneumatic boot ice bridging concern. It basically says that the old school thought was that you need to let the, build, the ice build to a quarter to a half inch on the leading edge of the wing and then kind of pop it off with the boots. The FAA is also saying that with the current de-ice boot technology we have, they do not have any evidence of ice bridging. That may have been a much older phenomenon, maybe back in the 80s on much older aircraft, but the way that do de-ice boots are made now, they do not believe that ice bridging ever occurs. They did state, and this is a quote, that recent studies, i.e. in 2006, have shown that at airspeeds typical of general aviation airplanes, ice buildup on modern boot designs will not shed with every boot inflation cycle. The ice that does not shed is residual ice and not due to bridging. So this is important to talk about because I know some pilots have said, no, I've seen it. I've seen that there's still ice on my wing. And to that, I just want to say, de-ice boots are not that great at getting ice off your airplane and a lot of pilots i've talked to will say so and so airplane handles ice so well and i do think that this is a dangerous attitude de-ice boots are not that great it's not a hot wing where it's going to whisk all the ice off and even if it was the purpose of de-icing equipment is to allow you to leave the icing area so if you are flying a plane that has de-ice boots you need to be aware that they're not going to get all the ice off of the airframe if you're in relatively high icing conditions. I think the important thing from this to know is what the FAA says, cycling modern boots early and often does not cause ice bridging and will not degrade ice shedding. Consult your AFM or POA for guidance on proper system use. And that is the most important part. You need to run your de-ice and anti-ice equipment per the manufacturer recommendation. We do not need to pick up some attitude on the line from an older experienced pilot, even if they're a Czech airman that says, I know the book says this, but trust me, I've done it for this many years and this is how we need to do it. That is dangerous and we need to stop doing that. I'd also like to look at a really great article from Air Facts Journal. Now, and this is not directly from the FAA and the NTSB, but I do think it has a lot of good information and I think we can learn from it. This was published November 30th of 2020. So this is a pretty recent article. This article by Steve Green basically starts off by sharing the experience that many pilots, including myself, have had, which is you get on the line on a new turboprop aircraft with boots and somebody above you tells you how to really operate those boots, which is basically let the ice build before you crack it off so you don't get ice bridging. He talks about an experience he had in flight where he was getting busy and task saturated and he just put the boots on auto and he was shocked to find that actually they removed ice better on that function by continuously running. He talks about where this idea of ice bridging came from, which was actually in 1997, where he participated in an FAA de-icing boot ice bridging workshop held at Ohio Aerospace Institute in Cleveland. He says that the consensus at the workshop was that the idea of ice bridging may have evolved from experience with early, low pressure, slow inflation time systems and was very unlikely with a high pressure rapid inflation deflation system. He also says that the current version of Advisory Circular 9174 Bravo Pilot's Guide Flight and Icing Conditions sums the argument up by essentially saying this is on older technology only and we should be using the boots per the manufacturer recommendation, which in general is at the first sign of ice accumulation. I'll link this article so you can read through it yourself because he has a lot of good data here. But overall, the opinion is ice bridging is kind of a myth that we need to get rid of. And you need to use your boots a lot to try to get the ice off because they're not going to remove all the ice all the time anyways. And ice is such a hazard to aerodynamics that we need to keep as much off the airframe as possible. I'd also like to talk about a safety alert from the NTSB from August of 2024. So just a few months ago, this safety alert says that some pilots have been taught to wait for a prescribed accumulation of leading edge ice before activating de-ice boots to alleviate ice accumulation on flight control surfaces because of the believed threat of ice bridging. However, performance degradation could develop if the de-ice boots are not activated as soon as icing is encountered. So why, with all of this information, is there an aviation safety expert telling CNN that this crash could have been caused by ice bridging? Generally, aviation safety experts are very high time pilots with their instructor ratings and all kinds of experience. So I actually looked this person up on the FAA registry and found that 
they only hold a student pilot certificate. Now, this does not take away from their aviation experience in general because they are an AMPIA and they do have that aviation safety inspector background on the mechanic side of the house, which is extremely valuable and respectable. However, I don't know that it is the best source of information for someone who has never flown in icing conditions to be perpetuating a myth that the NTSB and the FAA are working to put to bed. But again, they said in this quote from CNN that the pilots may have armed the de-ice boots too soon. Now I went back and I looked at the cockpit recording data and they only used the de-ice boots for about five minutes of an hour and 10 minute flight. And they were getting ice detection alerts throughout the whole time. So his opinion is that they armed it too soon. And I'm looking at that data and I'm saying they couldn't have used the boots any less. They flew for over an hour with an ice detection alert going off and no boots running. If you're going to think that ice bridging is occurring on this, then they're the perfect people to be using this to prevent ice bridging. They're letting it build for an hour and then popping it. And this is where the problem lies with ice bridging. Where is the time that you should pop the boots? I know we've said maybe a quarter to a half inch that somebody made up at some point in time. And the FAA has said that they have no data to support that. So you're just out there up in your plane, hanging out and just using the boots whenever you want. Like it just doesn't make any sense. You just need to run them when you got ice on the plane and get the ice off as best you can. And again, this is not a personal attack on this individual. This is to say that if someone with this much rapport, with this much experience and this background is still putting this ice bridging idea out there in the world, then this is something we really need to discuss as a community and say once and for all, stop doing this. In summary, if you are flying an aircraft with de-ice equipment, you need to use it in accordance with the manufacturer recommendation. Ice bridging has never caused a single airplane crash that we know of in the U.S. Many crashes have been caused by airplanes not using their de-ice equipment or flying in icing conditions that the airplane simply cannot handle. So if you are flying that airplane, you need to have a plan for how you're going to get out of the icing conditions. You may have to ask for special handling. You may have to ask to descend lower. You may have to be assertive, or you may just have to not go flying that day. All of these things are tools that you need to keep in mind. But I think it's very important for pilots that we don't become complacent and just allow the fact that it's been okay before and other pilots have told us that this plane can handle a lot of ice to make us make decisions that are unsafe. I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts, especially if there's any pilots that are typed in the ATR-72 and know a lot more about the specific manufacturer recommendations on running the boots in this particular airplane. It does sound like they could possibly have a different type of boot in Brazil if they didn't have the modifications that the U.S. made after crashes in the U.S. where they were getting ice buildup aft of the boots. I think it's really important in aviation for us to all share our knowledge to enhance safety. So I'd love to learn if you have anything else in the contrary to what I have said in this video that is backed by data and you can provide a link. I would love to see that. Let's share the information so we can make aviation better and safer for everybody. And thanks for watching.